Good afternoon, members and friends. On behalf of CFA Singapore and the Sim Kibun Institute, thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, we are very happy to partner with the Sim Kibun Institute at SMU for this particular <coughs> event. And I hope all of you will enjoy this afternoon's presentation by the Professor Harrison Hong. Uh, I'd like to hand over the podium to Prof Tu uh, to introduce the speaker. Prof. Thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jun Tu, a finance professor at uh, Singapore Management University and the co-director of the Center for Asset Securitization and Management in Asia. Today's talk on speculative betas is jointly organized by my center and the CFA Singapore. I'm so pleased to be with you today and to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Harrison Hong. Professor Harrison Hong is a John Scani, 66, professor of economics and finance at the Princeton University, where he teaches in courses in finance in the undergraduate, master, and PhD programs. His research has covered a wide range of topics, such as behavioral finance and the smart market efficiency, as the pricing and trading and their market imperfections, incentives and the biases in decision making, organizational form and performance, social interaction and the markets, and the socially responsible investing and the corporate social responsibility. On top of that, Professor Harrison Hong is on the editorial board of the Journal of Finance and the Inter International Journal of Central Banking. He's a director of the American Finance Association and a, a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. In addition, as one of the America's best thinkers, Professor Hartshorn gets lots of media attention, including the well-known Charlie Rose television talk show. Moreover, Moreover, amazingly, Professor Harrison Hong has made the most of his uh, remarkable achievements under the age of 40. Therefore, it's uh, no wonder that in the year of 2009, he was awarded the American Finance Association's Fisher Black Prize given by annually to the person under 40 who has contributed the most to the theory and practice of finance. Finally, like many of you, I have been eagerly anticipating this talk for a long time. Therefore, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving big hands to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Harrison Hong. All right. Um, well, thanks a lot, June, for uh, that great introduction. Thanks also for the CFA and the Simki Boon Institute for organizing uh, this lunch talk. So I guess. I'll try to entertain you for maybe 30 minutes uh, during your lunch hour, and then I'll take some Q&A. Um, so this talk is, uh, the topic of betas is, is a pretty personal topic for me. Uh, I, I graduated uh, from MIT when I was around 26, 27, and my first job was actually at Stanford Business School. Uh, and it was actually Bill Sharp's last year as a professor there before he uh, retired and started uh, Financial Engines as an internet startup company during the internet period. And so over that one year, I, I, I was lucky enough to hang out with Bill quite a bit and, and learn a lot from him. And, you know, the one thing I learned was, you know, why it is that he's the guy that came up with the CAPM. Uh, because he's an extremely clear thinker, extremely simple in terms of his um, presentation of his ideas. And, and, uh, and it's sort of been, you know, 15 plus years since I, I graduated. And recently I was uh, in uh, Amsterdam, of all places, with a couple of my students from Europe. Uh, we were hanging out at a suspicious pot bar uh, talking about some random stuff. And, uh, and then they asked me, well, what are you working on? And I said something like, well, you know, I'm, I'm working on uh, something having to do with uh, the capital asset pricing model with betas. And they said, oh, of course, you know. The CAPM, security, security market line should be upward sloping. High beta equals high return. Which sort of struck home to me, sort of just how influential um, Bill Sharp has been, you know, sort of in 
1997, he was probably still the most influential finance economist in the world. And you know, in 2012, he's still the most influential finance economist in the world. That you know, the sort of these ideas that he had starting in 1965 with beta and the capital asset pricing model uh, continues each day to have influenced kind of generations of both students and finance practitioners in terms of how they think about and interact with financial markets. Okay, so so this talk is about betas, and it's about uh, thinking about the following issue, which is, you know, even though I think we teach all of our students, and even though I think capital asset pricing model is still the, the heart, the bread and butter of financial economics, uh, we do have a fundamental problem with the theory, which is that it doesn't work. Uh, you know, so that uh, the risk return trade-off that is the central prediction of the CAPM that says that high beta assets, that is assets that co-vary more with the stock market, right? should command a high expected returns because they're kind of riskier from the perspective of an investor seeking diversification, uh, this risk return trade-off just doesn't seem to be there no matter how hard we try to find it, okay? Uh, and in fact, in, 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 in the data, in many cases, the high risk, uh, these high beta assets often come with actually low returns, okay? Uh, and so the, the question of why the security market line, uh, why is it so flat or why is it too flat on average is going to be what, uh, uh, what, what, what I'll be talking about. So why and when does the CAPM fail? What does this sort of imply for uh, investment strategies? Okay, so let me just be very specific about uh, exactly what the facts are. Okay, so I'm going to construct sort of a high risk and a low risk portfolio. Okay, by each month estimating uh, a stock's market data uh, using its past year of daily stock returns uh, by regressing the daily stock returns of that stock on the market return. Okay, you could do this in a number of different ways, but but basically you can kind of uh, you're going to get a beta for each stock out of uh, uh, this estimation. Right, and each month you can also estimate a stock's volatility using the past year's worth of uh, daily stock returns, and then you know you're going to kind of roll this portfolio along so every month you're going to estimate this new set of betas or this new set of volatilities for each stock using the past one year history of that stock. Okay? And then you form a portfolio. You're going to rank uh, all the stocks in the stock market uh, by its uh, beta or by its volatility. And then you'll just kind of uh, construct a portfolio and look at how this portfolio has performed uh, going out in sort of a live uh, uh, trading venue. Okay? And here's a plot uh, of what you know, so let's, let's say you started in 1968, and this is like January 1st of 1968, and you begin this process, okay? So here, uh, the bottom quintile represents uh, the low beta uh, portfolio, and then the top quintile represents the high beta portfolio, and, and pretty much the lines are monotonically uh, are moving from kind of a, a bottom to a top beta quintile. So if you started with a dollar in 1968, you would have ended up, if you put it into a low beta portfolio, something with like $96 uh, uh, around 2009. If you had put it into the high beta portfolio, you would end up with something like $7. Okay? So the thing that you observe is that the high beta portfolio is pretty volatile. Okay? And over this long sample period, you're not kind of getting compensation for the volatility, right? at least over this particular sample period. Okay? So what this means is that you know you can easily construct. Okay, this says that the security market line, uh, at least in this particular sample period, uh, is not only not flat, but it's almost basically going. It's completely going the other way, which is that high beta stocks uh, are actually uh, having low expected returns. Okay, and if you do the same thing for volatility, uh, you know the story is is, is sort of worse. Uh, you know, if you kind of look at a bottom volatility. Uh, a risky portfolio versus a top volatility risky portfolio, uh, you know, the answer is just much worse. Like the very, very high volatility portfolios, uh, portfolio just does extremely badly. Now actually, the, the interesting thing is that a lot of the big guys in finance, if you will, actually knew this even back in the 60s, okay? So here I have a, a memo from the old Wells Fargo asset management team. So I don't know if you guys know the history, but, but essentially Wells Fargo uh, in the late, in the mid 60s and 70s was where basically most of the most innovative academic finance and practitioner finance was being done, okay? Uh, they hired Bill initially. Uh, this was a very West Coast setup. And then some of the other guys involved were Black, Fisher Black, Myron Scholes, 
uh, Booth. Uh, Booth is the guy basically that now heads DFA and donated the $300 million to the University of Chicago. Uh, Vasicek, uh, some of you might know from if you do term structure stuff, and one of the pioneers of term structure modeling, McCown and also Wagner. So this is pretty much the dream team of, of quant finance, if you will, uh, uh, back in the 60s. And in this particular memo, uh, dated here in 1971, March 19th, they basically talk about how flat the security market line is uh, and how you might take advantage of the fact that the security market line is so flat, okay, by basically borrowing money and levering up and buying a lot of low beta stocks, right? So in other words, if you've got like low beta stocks and high beta stocks, right, that are e you know, yielding pretty much the same expected return, the low beta stock is eating up a much lower fraction of your risk budget, right? So as a result, you know, you can afford to basically lever and go into low beta stocks and therefore take advantage of the fact of the low volatility giving you kind of a similar uh, comparable return, okay? And, and this, this strategy, um, which they describe here, okay, uh, uh, of this kind of low risk portfolio lever to market risk, um, has been now recently kind of been brought back into the academic literature, okay? Uh, where, you know, there's a number of papers now, which I'll talk about briefly, that show that if you take a long position in a low beta portfolio and a short position in a high beta portfolio, okay? And you basically construct then a zero beta strategy because what's gonna happen is that when you long the low beta and you short the high beta, you have to borrow on the low beta end to kind of make sure you get the same amount of equivalent exposure to the market, right? So then the way you do this to get a zero beta strategy is you long the low beta portfolio by one over beta of the low beta portfolio and you short the high beta portfolio by an amount one over beta of the high beta portfolio, right? And then there's gonna be some adjustment for the risk-free rate because you're borrowing basically on the low beta leg, okay? And if you basically then adjust the returns by the, the fact that you have to borrow right, to basically buy the low beta portfolio, you now have a zero beta investment strategy. And if you look at how the strategy is performed, and if you compare it to other well-known uh, 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 management or asset pricing anomalies in the literature, including a momentum strategy and also a value growth strategy, what you find is that this betting against beta factor, BAB, yields a sharp ratio that's 1.4, okay? which is almost double the sharp ratio that you would get from a value strategy and from a momentum strategy, where the value strategy is buying basically uh, uh, value stocks and shorting growth stocks, and the momentum strategy is buying past winners and shorting past losers. So UMD, HML are probably the two most famous examples of quantitative strategies that practitioners around the world use to manage portfolios to give them kind of an added expected return uh, uh, relative to sort of the uh, buying just simply the market portfolio. And if you were to do this BAB portfolio, you're getting a sharp that's almost double, okay? And what's remarkable is that it's everywhere. I mean, it's in all asset classes, it's across time, it's across countries, it's global, okay? Um, so that, you know, the notion, okay, that Guys are going there and buying low beta stocks with leverage because it's extremely uh, uh, cheap relative to sort of these high beta stocks is exactly kind of what we want to talk about today is why, is, what's going on? Why is it that it seems like uh, in almost kind of every asset class, in, 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 in almost every venue, across time, across the globe, why is it that the security market line is, is, is so flat? Okay. Why is it that the high beta stocks are not generating uh, the, comp the, the, the proper amount of compensation for the risk that you're taking? And, and this is what I kind of call the puzzle of puzzles, right? You know, because basically this is sort of the heart of what we teach and the heart of how we think about asset markets is that, you know, if we take lots of risk that's under for spike, right, we should get compensated, okay? And yet, you know, this doesn't sort of seem to be happening uh, in financial markets, okay? All right, so the, the idea is pretty simple. Uh, so this is what we call kind of speculative betas, which is, so this is, uh, uh, the, the, the theory is joint work with David Schreier, who's one of my young colleagues at Princeton. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the real details of the paper. You can kind of download it from the website or just Google speculative betas. I'll just kind of explain the heart of the idea, 
and then show you some empirical facts to support the idea, and then I'll open it up for, for, for Q&A. So the, the idea is pretty simple. Um, we're gonna have two ingredients, okay, that uh, we think explain uh, what's going on with the data. Okay, uh, the first ingredient is what I'll call kind of uh, disagreeing about macro factors. All right, so there's just kind of lots of macro factors that drive the uh, stock market, so like, you know, recessions, business cycle stuff. Okay, and investors can disagree about that, right? So this is not private information. Nobody has like a hotline to Ben Bernanke, right? But we have very, very different types of education. Some are Keynesians, some are monetarists, some are Austrians, some graduated from Chicago, some graduated from like Harvard. You're just gonna have a very different view about what's going on with the macroeconomy, okay? And whether the economy is headed for inflation or whether the economy is headed for deflation, okay? You know, whether the economy will pick up or whether the economy is basically in the tanks, right? Guys just kind of have different views. They will be optimists, guys who think that the economy uh, are gonna grow, and there will be pessimists, guys who think that the economy uh, is headed for deflation, okay? That's the first ingredient. Uh, and the second ingredient is uh, some notion of costly short selling that is more expensive to short sell than it is to buy. So in particular here, uh, I'm gonna focus on the institutional constraints. So it's not that it's physically so expensive to short a lot of big stocks, it's just that most institutions are just prohibited. Like think about mutual funds in the US, think about mutual funds around the world, right? The vast majority of money is indexed to a long only type of product, yeah? So even if the managers there become very pessimistic, the most they're gonna do is just dump their position. Right, and in many cases, they're probably not even gonna dump their position because they're indexed to some type of a benchmark. Okay, so there's a huge long bias in the market. So if you combine these two ingredients, okay, what you're gonna get is the following. High beta assets are just more sensitive to these macro disagreements, right? So think about two types of stocks. What's a low beta asset? It's like a utilities company. Okay, so there's a utilities company, you know, let's call it, I don't know what the name of the utilities company in Singapore is, but it's probably like Singapore Power or something, right? Singapore Power and Utility. <laughs> what is it? Owned by the government. Owned by the government, right. Nothing is going to be more low beta than that, right? <laughs> uh, the economy goes up, okay, the economy goes down, we still need electricity, right? You know, you're not going to get that much of a speculative play off of betting on Singapore utilities, yeah? Now think about a more high-flying tech stock, okay? Uh, you know, or think about you know a more middle-class restaurant chain that's consumer-oriented, where depending on whether the economy is doing well, that restaurant chain could be really generating a lot of profits or basically going into bankruptcy, yeah? Or like the same with a tech stock. So high beta assets, by construction, are more sensitive to the macroeconomy. Disagreements about the macroeconomy naturally manifests itself much more in high beta assets than low beta assets. Okay? So, you know, even if guys are just super diverging on their views about the macroeconomy, they're never going to diverge that much about the cash flows of Singapore Power and electric utilities. But they will diverge a lot about, you know, a restaurant chain or a tech stock. Therefore, disagreement about the macroeconomy means there's much more scope for disagreeing about the cash flows of a particular asset that's high beta. And as a result, with short sales constraints, what that's just gonna mean is that high beta assets will only be ever owned by the optimist, right? Because the pessimist can't short. Low beta assets will always be held by everybody. Low, you know, whether you're like an optimist or you're a pessimist, it doesn't really matter. You're never gonna disagree that much, right, about uh, 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 Singapore power, okay? So what this means is that high beta assets are more speculative because it's more sensitive to the macroeconomy. And when you have some type of a long bias in the market, that means they're much more likely to be overpriced than low beta assets. Okay? And so kind of the main prediction of this theory is that the CAPM holds when there's not a lot of disagreement about the macroeconomy. But the CAPM doesn't hold and in fact, the cap bound is gonna to lead to high beta assets being extremely overvalued in contrary to the prediction of the cap bound when there's a lot of uncertainty about the economy, okay? So big uncertainty about the economy, big disagreements about the economy lead to 
overpricing of high bid assets. That's basically the theory. Okay? And what I'm going to show you <coughs> is some facts to basically kind of uh, uh, support this. So uh, let me kind of let me show you what the security market line. So here's here's basically the what's going to happen with with the uh, with the plot. So let me just explain some terms. So the, the upward sloping shape is exactly the, the cap M, which is the security market line is upward sloping. So here on the x-axis is beta, on the y-axis is the expected excess return uh, of different stocks or different assets, net of the risk-free rate. So what I call lambda here is a parameterization in our model that captures how much disagreement there is between optimist and pessimist. So I go from a lambda low to a lambda high. Okay, so the blue line represents a very low uh, lambda. Uh, as I increase lambda, which from the red line all the way down to the gold line, you're going to get more and more disagreement. And the way that the model works is the following. When there's no disagreement about the macroeconomy, the cap M holds, upward sloping security market line. The second disagreement starts increasing, macro disagreements, you're going to begin to find the marginal stock in the stock market. That is the stock with a high enough beta, at which for all the stocks with a beta above that stock, short sales constraints will bind, right? because these are all the high beta stocks. And as disagreement increases, more and more stocks in the economy basically experience uh, this binding short sales constraint. Right? So when there's like kind of a very low amount of, of disagreement, only the super high beta stocks will ever be speculative. When the disagreement increases, now even moderate beta stocks will become speculative in the sense that they're only held by optimists. Yeah? And then, you know, if the disagreement is so high, you could even have low beta stocks become basically uh, speculative. Okay? And the prediction is that the security market line is going to be kink-shaped. It's going to actually take on this inverted U-shape where if you look at very low beta to moderate beta, you're going to get the cap band. But above a certain beta threshold, you can actually get a kink or a downward sloping security market line. Okay? And this is the shape that we're going to try to look for in the data. So what I showed you earlier was data which suggests that basically on average, right, if you sort on beta with expected returns, the security market line is flat. Right? What I'm going to try to convince you is that if I take the data over the last 30 years in the, in the world macroeconomy, and what I'm going to do is divide it into the states of the world where one state is where there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of disagreement, and I'm going to measure this using professional forecasters and to see how much professional forecasters' views about the macroeconomy diverge. Yeah? And so times in which they diverge a lot is when I'm going to get this kind of the bottom kink-shaped security market line. And then times when there's a lot of consensus and there's not a lot of standard deviation in these macro forecasters' uh, 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 predictions is when you're going to get a kind of an upward slope of security market line. Okay? Um, so let me show you uh, uh, some plots here. So I'm going to just jump through all this stuff. So here's, let me show you this, this first plot. So this is a, uh, I'm not sure if the color is completely coming through, but so starting in 1981, I'm going to show you two plots, uh, two, two time series here, okay? Uh, on the x-axis is just time. The red line is a measure of the standard deviation of security analyst annual forecasts, okay, to long-term forecasts, a weighted average of both their annual and also their long-term forecasts of S&P 500 earnings, okay? Yeah, so if you look at the red line here, okay, this is the 81 recession, this is the dot-com period, this is the recent financial crisis. Okay? Now, so let me tell you the story of the, the, of the U.S. analysts. So there, there's basically about, um, you know, security analysts are a pretty big deal in the U.S. Uh, they generate tons and tons of estimates about the earnings of, uh, of the U.S. stock market. Okay? So what you're seeing here is, this is, think of this as like the standard deviation of all the analysts that are forecasting on the U.S. stock market. So in the 81 recession, Right? Usually what happens is that when there's a big recession or when there's a big boom, the analyst forecasts start to diverge a lot. Okay? Because you know, some guys think that the economy is going to mend, some guys think that the economy is not going to mend. Going into uh, the tranquil period in the U.S. economy, 
right? You see kind of a little bit of like movement, right? But then you see a big spike in these disagreements, pretty much at the peak of the dot-com period. If you look at the peak of the dot-com period, every analyst is issuing, like there's a wide band, there's a huge amount of disagreement about what the S&P earnings was gonna be. Then it kind of comes down again, and then obviously during the financial crisis, this thing kind of explodes again, right? Because again, lots of uncertainty about where the economy is headed. On the blue line is the returns, okay, to a strategy, all right, that's just basically a 12-month valuated returns of a low versus high beta portfolio, okay? If you look at this correlation, right, what you're gonna see is that uh, here, big disagreement, low returns. Here, big disagreement, low returns coming forward. And then actually, if you look at the correlation of this, it's actually fairly high. Okay? So periods in which there's a lot of uncertainty as measured by sort of this disagreement uh, 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 about kind of uh, 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 the, the disagreement among the analysts is when you're gonna get, actually gonna get uh, uh, fairly low returns um, to, sorry, fairly high returns to the low versus the high beta portfolio, right? So you're buying low returns and you're shorting the high returns, the high beta stocks, okay? Um, here's sort of the, the more scatter plot. Again, taking this monthly series and then just plotting it out, what you're gonna get is that here's the high disagreement months, these are the low disagreement months. In the high disagreement months, the low beta stocks, the high beta stocks really uh, um, underperform, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you splitting this time series up, okay? I'm gonna split the sample up here into two subsamples. One is kind of a low disagreement subsample, which would be like here, and the other would be kind of this high disagreement subsamples, which would be here. And if you look at the security market line, this is what you find. So in the low disagreement months, this is the relationship between beta and expected return. Okay, it's pretty much up to sloping. In the high disagreement months, you're gonna get this king shape. Okay. So that's basically kind of the prediction that we have here. That's what we're trying to kind of figure out. Right? Because what's going on is that the high beta stocks are the ones that are really massively kind of underperforming uh, because in our theory, what's going on is that in these very high disagreement periods, the optimists are the only guys that are holding these high beta stocks. Low beta stocks never have this problem, okay? You're never gonna get binding short sales constraints because you know, guys never disagree enough about these low beta stocks. Right? You're always gonna get some type of an upward slope with a low beta stock. It's just the high beta stocks are, 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 are very underperforming. Okay? Um, Here's the next thing, for six month returns, you get the same shape. This was like a 12 month return. This is a six month return. And this is like a three month return, okay? You're gonna get roughly kind of the same looking shapes no matter what horizon you're kind of looking at. Um, you know, upward sloping security market line for low enough beta stocks, decreasing or downward sloping security market line for, for high beta stocks, right? So that when you then average, okay, the different samples, the reason you see a flat security market line is because you've got one half of the sample is upward sloping, one half of the sample is downward sloping. You average this, you're gonna get basically flat. Yeah? So what people have looked at is just they observe, well look, you know, the security market line is just extremely flat. Right? There's just like no relationship between beta and expected returns. So flat that you can make money by borrowing stocks, by borrowing money to buy low beta stocks and shorting high beta stocks. Okay? And this is sort of a theory for why that's the case, which is that high beta stocks are very speculative, particularly in times when you have a lot of disagreement about the macroeconomy. Okay? And as a result, they're much more likely to be overpriced during times in which there's a lot of disagreement about the macroeconomy, leading then to kind of a downward sloping security market line for high enough beta stocks. All right? Now, there's a couple of other predictions that we can also do that kind of put put our theory to the test. Here I'm gonna show you a plot that's, here's the dispersion of the analyst forecast for different betas, of the different stocks. This is the average of these dispersions in the different beta portfolios. Not surprisingly, if you look at low beta stocks, there's just not much disagreement as you go across beta. But for high beta stocks, in times when there's a lot of uncertainty, 
right? As we predicted, it's almost kind of an implication of uh, 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 the mechanism, right, of our theory, which is that, you know, high beta stocks, there's a lot of disagreement among the security analysts in times when there's a lot of uncertainty. Here, low beta stocks, not much disagreement, no matter what happens, okay? Uh, so the mechanism we think that's going on is that exactly in this graph, lots of uncertainty means lots of dispersion about these earnings forecasts for high beta stocks, right? High beta stocks are just hard to forecast, right? Because they're so sensitive to the macro economy. You know, you're going to always be able to get pretty even, pretty similar forecasts no matter who looks at Singapore Power. But, you know, for like a tech stock, you know, it's already tough enough to forecast that when there's not a lot of uncertainty in the economy, you really ratchet up the economy, right? These high beta stocks are so sensitive to these macro factors, you're going to get a lot more disagreement about these, these stocks. You also see here, I'm going to show you short shorting. So, as I said, one implication, one, one, one assumption we have is that, you know, uh, lots of institutions, okay, mutual funds, don't want to short. They can't short. But it doesn't mean that some hedge funds couldn't short. So we could see whether the hedge funds think that there's more overpricing in high beta stocks by looking at short interests, right? And in fact, that's what you find. You find that high beta stocks have actually much higher shorting, particularly in times when there's a lot of disagreement about uh, the macro economy, okay? Now, the assumption we're making is that there's just not enough of these hedge funds around to kind of pull the prices of these high beta stocks back to earth, right? Uh, there's a little bit of shorting that goes on, but there's just not that much shorting that goes on in the world to kind of compensate for the fact that you have all of this like institutional long-only bias uh, that, that overwhelms basically the limited amount of shorting that you actually see in stock markets. So that, you know, the, the amount of shorting we see is very tiny, right? Even for a high beta stock in a very extreme period, you're only getting about 4.5% short interest ratio, which is a very, very modest amount of shorting that goes on for these stocks. Okay? But it is consistent with our our, our, our prediction that you do see basically kind of more action in the direction we predicted, which is that high beta stocks are uh, overpriced. Now, another implication, if you kind of extend the model to a dynamic setting, is that you should also see that high beta stocks should trade much more, right? Because like speculative stocks just turn over much more because guys basically uh, are speculating, right? There's a lot of action going on. So lots of turnover is a symptom for lots of speculation in the financial markets. And again, we see that times of high disagreement, high beta stocks receive much higher turnover uh, 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 than low beta stocks. In fact, turnover turns out to be an extremely interesting variable. If you look at most of the turnover in the world, most of it actually comes from a very small subset of very, very high beta stocks. Right? They represent the vast majority of the action, if you will, uh, in the market. Right? So kind of a lot of the big turnover numbers that we're seeing nowadays, 200%, 300% turnover globally in stock markets, a lot of it is coming from pretty much 20% of the high beta stocks in the market. If you drop those guys, the turnover for stocks just dropped way, way down. Uh, okay. So, you know, again, we think that this is consistent with sort of this mechanism that, you know, reason the cap amp doesn't work is because there's two sides to beta. There's the risk sharing side to beta that Bill Sharp discovered in 1965. But there's also a speculative side to beta, right? Which is that high beta is both simultaneously, you know, more risk averse investors don't like high beta stocks, but optimistic investors do like high beta stocks, right? Because they're very, very sensitive uh, to the macro economy. Okay? So let me conclude here. And, 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 and kind of open up some questions. We do a bunch of other stuff. You can kind of look at the paper. There's lots of kind of other interesting things you can do. Uh, but, but, the, but the crux of idea is, is basically the, the one that I've, I've articulated. Now, in particular, you can kind of do a bunch of other stuff uh, by using signals uh, that would be implications for asset management by looking at the exits of mutual funds or equity funds from a particular stock from the market. Because when funds leave uh, a particular stock, that's a signal that uh, there's a binding short sales constraint in the market. Uh, you could also look at the dispersion of individual uh, forecasts for individual stocks. That's also a trading signal. Uh, we're working on some other stuff to try to figure out uh, when the market is overpriced by looking at the gap between low beta and high beta stock turnover. Right? So we think that what's going on is that when high beta stocks have a lot of trading relative to low beta stocks, that's a market signal that the market is very frothy about the high beta stocks. 
right? That there's a lot of disagreement going on in the macroeconomy. And that's also kind of a good uh, asset allocation signal. Okay, so there's lots of conditional strategies that we think are promising for thinking about and refining why it is that the CAPM may not work unconditionally, but why it may work conditional on there not being a lot of macro disagreement, and when it doesn't work, when there's a lot of macro disagreement. Okay. And so let me just conclude here. Uh, you know, kind of the, 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 the theory is extremely simple. It's built off of the CAPM. Right? It's simply basically taking the cap M and adding one additional assumption, well, two additional assumptions. Disagreement about the macro factor and basically short sales constraints. And if you kind of introduce these two elements, you end up getting actually quite a lot of interesting implications mm -hmm. off of the cap M. That's what I think of as an extension that we could easily kind of incorporate and teach to finance practitioners, MBAs, undergraduates, that I think gives a much more accurate view about the risk return trade-offs in financial markets than what the CAPM uh, 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 gives. High beta means more sensitive to macro disagreement, and therefore during these times, command high prices and overpricing due to costly short selling. Uh, there's obviously kind of a number of capital budgeting implications that one might think of in terms of calculating the cost of capital for firms. Uh, and obviously, needless to say, uh, this is sort of a useful uh, uh, benchmark to think about uh, uh, asset management uh, in terms of uh, whether you be kind of doing asset allocation or even stock picking. Okay, so let me stop there and I'll take some questions.